<laughs> Lord Jesus, we just we just come to you humbly, Lord, and we just ask that you just um, use and speak, Father, uh, move through TK, Father God, and just let um, his words be your words tonight, Father God. And I just pray, Lord, for the hearts to be open tonight, Father God, and just a willingness, Father, to receive your words, Father, and we just love you, and we bless you, and we praise you, and all glory to you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kit Kat. Well, great to see you all, hey? It uh, just, I, I was reminded this week as well, man, this whole thing down south here is initiated in the heart of God. Not a, not a good idea, but like... No, hey, huh? just as well, yeah, no. yeah. I've had a lot of good ideas in my life. Somehow, most of them didn't work out. So I'm glad this is a God idea. <laughs> Every time I have a good idea, it ends up in a horrible mess. So, yeah, Sandy's okay. So uh, we started. We've been on this little series, stewardship series. And it, it, is our, it is our heart to mirror more and more. That, and that doesn't mean exactly, it doesn't mean we're going to preach exactly down here what we preached up there in the morning, but to kind of carry the same theme and to, and to do some of those things. And so in September, we start in a, a series that uh, um, Chris emailed us about and said, hey, we feel like this would be a good series to come after partnership and after stewardship. And it simply is a whole series on the gospel. And it's some of, the, some of the subject titles and all of that is the need for the gospel, why the gospel, all of these kind of things, the effects of the gospel, gospel and parenting, gospel and finances, all of these kind of things. And so I think it's going to be, I can't remember how many, and it might even grow a little bit, but I think eight or nine weeks just on the gospel. And uh, I think it's going to be an incredible series. Um, in spite of what I said about people, elders taking vacation while people are going to hell, I am going... <laughs> I am going on vacation in September, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, we cancelled it after after what I said this morning. It's next, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so the elders, the elders are going to kick that series off in September, and again, we we just want to mirror it down here. Again, it doesn't mean we're going to preach exactly the same thing, but we certainly want to start to carry the same theme down here, right? And so I want to carry on a little bit with us, with our stewardship series this evening. And uh, so go with me in your Bible, if you have one, to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. And so we're going to read just the first six verses of this, uh, this chapter and then skip down to verse 12. But uh, here we go. Genesis 26, verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt to live in the land where I tell you to live. Now, there's a context to that, right? Because that's exactly what Abraham did when he had the famine. He went and lived in a different land, and that's when he lied about Sarah and got into trouble with that, right? And so the Lord is protecting Isaac here and saying, don't do what your daddy did, right? Don't go down there. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you, right? For to you and your descendants, I will give these lands and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them these lands, and through your offspring all nations will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my commandments, my commandments, my decrees, my laws. And so Isaac stayed in Gerar. Okay, so here we go, verse 12. Isaac planted, a crop, or planted crops in that land. Which land? The land of famine. Right, the land of famine. Which land? The land of famine. And in that same year, reaped a hundredfold reward because the Lord blessed him. Are you doing okay? So Isaac planted crops in that land, the land of famine. Isaac understood 
inherently. These guys grew up as farmers. And so it's so funny when we're talking in the mo- this morning and you're talking about seed and sowing and crops. And that's such a foreign concept to most of us. It is a real foreign concept to most of us. I grew up on a farm in Zambia. It was more cattle than it was crops, but still we understood this thing of planting crops and waiting for those crops to come about. And so unless you do that as a hobby or you've got a vegetable garden, most people in our day have got absolutely zero concept for planting, for sowing, and waiting for something to happen. Are you doing okay? But for these guys, it was their life. It was everyday life. These were principles that they just understood. Their chances are in those days had helped their parents from a young age do these things. And so Isaac understands these principles that he's talking about, that we were talking about this morning. So I'm going to look a few, at a few of those principles again this evening, right? But I just want to go over that thing that I said about God and mammon this morning, right? And that scripture that says you cannot serve God and mammon, and we take that just to be like, okay, well, you can't serve God and love money. Well, you can't serve God and money. That's not at all the context of that scripture. The Assyrians were the guys that set up banking, banking systems and interest. And let me tell you, in the context of, of banks... Interest is what keeps poor people poor. Because the rich can always lend money and charge interest, and the poor always have to borrow money and pay interest. And so because of that single thing, the gap between the rich and the poorer gets better and better. In spite of the last 50 years where there's been a... What did I say? So if you get caught up in the if you get caught up in the details, you're never going to see the kingdom. I'm just telling you that right now. Okay, but what? <laughs> I'm tired. I need to go on vacation, man. I'm telling you now, man. <laughs> gets bigger and bigger, just like the gospel gets gooder and gooder. This gap gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so we settle. Does it make sense? Listen, 50 years there's been this real drive, like worldwide to close the gap between the rich and the poor. And in spite of 50 years of worldwide effort, the gap between the rich and the poor is getting bigger and bigger because of this simple thing, interest, that was set up by the Assyrians. And when they set the system up, they set up a God to oversee, little g, God, to oversee this banking system and interest and all of that thing. And that God's name was Mamonas which is where we get our English word money from, mammon money. But it was a God that oversaw that thing. That's why when it comes to our money, when it comes to tithing, when it comes to giving, when it comes to sowing, there's an element of worship in it. Because it's showing us which system I'm going to put my money in, which system I'm going to honor, Am I going to honor this other system or am I going to honor the system that God has set up, the ways that God has set up, this issue of seed and sowing? Are you doing okay? Isaiah 55 verse 8 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. I mean, it's so fascinating, even in the old covenant that they talk about this stuff of like my ways, right? Because I think sometimes we get like, oh, well, this is a rule. This is a law that I have to obey. No, it's not. So I, I'm going to get myself in so much trouble. Oh, it's okay. I'm going on vacation. Yeah, that's right. It's like, can we go any lower? Where do we go from here? Uh, but here's the thing, right? So many people talk about this thing of tithing, and they're like, is there tithing in the New Testament? And I want to say yes, because Jesus affirms it. He says, you tithe, you, 
you tithe, but you neglect these other issues, and you should, have given, you should have given yourself to those issues without neglecting the tithe. So Jesus affirms the tithe. And so when people say the tithe isn't in the New Testament, I want to say, yes, it is. But, but you're not going to like my but. Because actually the New Testament goes way beyond tithing and goes into transformational generosity where people sold their property, sold everything they had and came and brought it to the church. So if you want to talk New Testament giving as opposed to Old Testament giving, I'd love to for us to walk into that and for you all to sell everything you own and come bring it to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but, you, but you understand what I'm saying? So the, these things aren't laws, they aren't rules, but actually the ways of God. That's what we're going to focus on and think about. It's the ways of God. And so the ways of God are this, seed time and harvest. The ways of God is that every single thing God gives us has a seed element to it. Are you doing okay? And he says it like this, my ways are not your ways. Right? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth, Samantha, It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. When you understand these things, verse 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. And instead of the briar and myrtle, um, instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown. What have we been talking about stewardship? Stewardship brings God honor and glory. When we take care of the things that God has given us, that God has given to us in such a way that we bring honor and glory to his name. That's the very definition of stewardship. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. You doing okay? One more. Genesis 22. Ah, sorry, Genesis 8, verse 22. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See, I'm really not used to working with a handheld anymore. Uh Old school. There's no school like old school. Okay, Genesis 8, verse 22. Here we go. I quoted this this morning, but now we're going to read the scripture, right? As long as the earth endures. As long as the earth endures. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So no more can day and night cease. No more can summer and winter cease. No more can cold and heat cease than seed time and harvest can cease. Does that make sense? These are the ways of God. These are the ways of God. And it, when it comes to stewardship, when it comes to finances, there are ways of God that God has set in order for us, right? Okay, I'm going to give you a few quick ways of God. Number one, God gives seed to the sower. God gives seed to the sower. Seed is for sowing. Now listen, people get, why well, you expecting me to give everything away? Listen to the language. Seed is for the sower. Fruit is to consume, but the seed is for the sower. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's not like we, God expects us to live on nothing or do nothing or have nothing. But everything we have has a seed element to it. Does that make sense? Everything God brings to us has a seed element. And so the seed is this tiny little element. But if it's not in the ground, not going to grow. If seed is consumed or wasted or thrown out, it will not produce a crop. There's not a farmer anywhere in the world, first world farmer that's 
plowing and harvesting with multi-million dollars of equipment, or a guy in Africa that is walking behind a cow pulling one of those old school plows. There's not a farmer anywhere in the world that you will convince with your best arguments to go out and check on his crop one day if he knows he didn't put seed in the ground. Make sense? There can only be a crop if there's seed in the ground. We can only expect a harvest of whatever it is. We can only expect a harvest from that thing. Finances, righteousness, whatever it is, we can only expect a harvest if we know we've put seed in the ground. You doing okay? Number two, the harvest is decided at the time of planting. You don't decide your harvest later. You decide your harvest now. I often say this, the kingdom of God is the only, the only place, the only entity, the only thing that you are writing your job description for the next two to five years by what you are doing now, by how you are sowing now, by how you are faithful now with what you are giving yourself to now. You decide. Why? Because of this principle of seed time and harvest. What you put in the ground now, hours of study, learning to play a guitar, whatever it is, is going to bear fruit down there. Does that make sense? I, I love Cheryl's worship. I really do. But just, I mean, Cheryl, when you guys went to the South Coast, you couldn't play a guitar, is that right? Nobody, nobody in her family ever played the guitar. And so they, they go down South Coast to take over this little church. Cheryl learns the guitar so that she can lead worship in that church. Right? And so now we watch on a Sunday morning and there's fruit from that thing. There's a harvest to that thing to which we all the beneficiary. But there was seed that was sown there. Hours playing on the guitar. Hours practicing. Probably a few Sundays that you felt you got up and you went home and you were like, that wasn't great. But it's seed in the ground. Does that make sense? Now there's a harvest from that seed that she sowed. You doing okay? What did I say? The harvest is decided at the time of planting. Seed must be planted in good ground. Seed must be planted in good ground. That's what is, what number are you on? Okay, well I don't care. Just write it down. Just make up the number. Just go ABC. I don't care. What number do you want it to be? It's an actual point. Seed must be planted in good ground. Does that not sound like a good point? I thought it was a good point. I mean, I can take it out if you want. Seed must be planted in good ground. Huh? <laughs> 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 Look at, see, there's a second part to this question, right? We can say, okay, Isaac planted seed in that land. Which land? The land of famine. There's a second part to that thing. Because we can say this, we can say, Isaac planted seed in that land. Which land? The land God spoke to him about. Because remember, God said, don't go to Egypt. Stay in this land and I'll bless you. Seed has to be planted in good land. It has to be planted in the place that God has spoken to you about planted it. Listen, when it comes to local church, you will only grow where you planted. You can't flit around and be here and there. And there. It's like you're not rooted. You're not planted. You are not going to grow. You're not going to produce fruit like that. Are you, are you doing all right? Be wise about where you sow your seed. Be wise about where you invest your life. Be wise in what you invest your life in. You doing right? Yeah. Number four, Matthew. <laughs> expense is at the time of sowing. That's when the expense is. The expense isn't in the harvest. The expense is now. I'm sowing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I just mean like some, you know, we, we get a ton of those people on Sunday morning. Oh, I'm visiting this church now. I'm visiting that church. It's like actually you rooted. What has God said? And that's like when we do coming to family in our church, 
we ask people at the end of that class, do you believe God is planting you at Redemption City Church? Because if God's planting you, yeah, that's when you invest your life. And if this is where you invest your life because you planted and rooted and grounded yeah, you'll see fruit in your life where God has told you to be rooted and planted. Did that answer the question okay? Thank you. What? Yeah, but he was a good question. Okay, number four. Expense is at the time of sowing. Listen, expense is at the time of sowing. <laughs> Look, the expense, the expense isn't later. The expense, later, it's, the harvest is coming back to you. The expense is at the time of sowing. You've either got the seed or you've got to go buy the seed, but there's an expense there. There's an expense in sowing hours of practicing the guitar. That's, that's the expensive part. That's the hard part. The hard part is the sowing. But, but let me just say this. Please don't delay the sowing. Because if you delay the sowing, you delay the harvest. If you delay the sowing, you delay the harvest. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Get seed in the ground. Which brings us to number five. There's a period of time between sowing and reaping. There's a period of time between sowing and reaping. I was young, so I'm 37, and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, listen, nor their children begging for bread. If I have to do this my whole life and not see an ounce of blessing from it so that my children are in this place, then that's the harvest. Then what's... What's asked of me is that I put seed in the ground and there's this period of time that's waiting that might be 30 years, 40 years. I don't care. So that my children are in that place. People say to me, TK, you're a good father. You know what I say? Too soon to tell. I want to wait until my kids are married. I want to see how they treat their wives and how they raise their kids. Then we can have a conversation about whether I did a good job as a parent or not. What, what, is that what is that talking about? That's the harvest. That's the real harvest. That's the real fruitfulness of my, the real fruitfulness of my parenting will be how my kids treat their wives and how they raise their kids. That will be the real fruitfulness. Look at that time. Look at that time period. There's a time period between sowing and seeing the harvest. And in that instance of your, of, for me, for my children, don't know how you guys see that, but for me and my children, that might be 30 years. That might be 40 years. But am I going to delay the sowing of the seed? Am I going to wait till they're 20 before I start talking to them about these things? No, I'm not. It's like, you need to pick up your chonny, son. Your wife's not going to appreciate that one day. And Blazer's like, just trying to get out the first grade, Dad. It's cool. But there's no, there's no too soon a time to put seed in the ground. There's no too soon a time to start talking to them about those things. Started a business with my boys because I'm convinced of this. Organizational, people think I'm, people think I'm against education because I quit when I was 14. I really am not. I just understand there are some limits to formalized education. And the two things formalized education generally does not teach you is creativity and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And so I started a business with my boys so that I can teach them this stuff while they're at college. And they're learning to keep books. They're learning to close the books on a date and pay out on a date and do all of these things. I gave them a couple of thousand dollars. I own 20% of the business. I get my $2,000 back and I own 20% of that business forever. Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank got nothing on me. I could teach the sharks how to shark. But, but same thing, right? With the seed. Where was the seed? The seed was expensive. I had to write a $2,000 check to kick this thing off. That's the seed. The fruit might not even be money. The fruit might be these boys learn some lessons about keeping a business, about keeping a set of books, about how to run, how to hustle, how to be creative in terms of how they market things and all that. And I get a few cool pairs of shoes out of it every now and then as well, so we're doing all right. Okay, where was I? Nobody even knows anymore. No, man, I haven't finished five yet. I was young and now I'm old. It's a period of time between sowing and reaping. 
don't be disheartened. That's what the prosperity message got wrong. The prosperity message taught people to put their tithe in the offering and run home and see if somebody put money under the door for them. It doesn't work like that. This thing might be decades. It might be generations. It might be generations until we see the fruit from what we've put in the ground. But we don't have another option because these are the ways of God. Are you doing okay? What are we doing down south here every Sunday night? Putting seed in the ground. Why? Because we believe there's a harvest to come from this area. Are you doing okay? Seed time and harvest. These are the ways of God. Karaba shakata. Number six. Every seed contains the DNA of radical multiplication. Every seed carries the DNA of radical multiplication. Because see, we could cut an apple open and count how many seeds are in that apple. But you cannot take one of those apple seeds and decide the potential of how many apples are in that apple seed. That you can't do. Because you can have years of crops from that thing and you can plant all the seeds from the years of crops and have multiple trees that have multiple years of crops. That's the radical DNA of God's principle of seed in the ground. There's a DNA, there's a multiplication DNA in that seed that is impossible for us to understand until we put it in the ground and see the harvest come out. You do not. God is always about moving the ordinary to the valuable. Just ordinary, right? Just ordinary. Water to wine. Just ordinary. To what's valuable. Just ordinary to what's valuable. Moses, what's that in your hand? It's a stick, Lord. God asks him to lay it down. Turns it to a snake, picks it up. It's that stick that splits the Red Sea, that saves a nation and a generation. It's that stick that strikes a rock to see water come out. Does that make sense? What's that in your hand? It's a stick. What's that in your hand? Well, it's just my this. Well, what's that in your hand? It's just my little paycheck. What's that in your hand? It's just this. But until we lay it down, until we can put seed in the ground, we cannot imagine what God can do with that thing. God is always about moving the ordinary to the valuable. The story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son shows us that nothing is devalued in the eyes of God, even when it's a little thing and even when it's lost. When we bring it back into the order of God, it becomes incredibly valuable. You doing okay? God is always about adding value to our best efforts. You know the, the story of the, of the disciples fishing, right? And Jesus comes up to them and he goes, throw the net on the other side of the boat. And there's so many layers to this thing. I'm just going to focus on this one. There's layers to that story, Right? Throw the nets on the other side of the boat. What do they say? Master, we've been fishing all night. You know what he didn't do? Jesus didn't go up to a bunch of lazy fishermen sitting on the shore. We've worked hard all night. Throw the nets on the other side of the boat. How wide was that boat? I don't know, 15, 20 feet. Not catching fish there, John's you're not catching fish here. But because they make this extra effort, because they say, yes, master, because you say so, because you say so, we're going to buy into the ways of God here. Because you say so, we're going to chuck the nets on the other side of the boat. They chuck the nets on the other side of the boat. Harvest is so great, they've got to call their buddies. Come help us, our boat's sinking. Does that make sense? But God adds to our effort. What is the effort that we're talking about here in the context of seed time and harvest? Us putting seed in the ground. You're doing right. And when we put seed in the ground, God adds to our natural effort. He adds his supernatural value. And we see a crop that we could never have imagined or pictured. You're doing okay. Such exciting times for us, man. Such exciting times. But like I said, not a, not a time for the church or believers to be asleep at the wheel in this nation. Not a time for churches to be dozing in this nation and just be like, yeah, we'll just, go, we'll just carry on, just business as usual. Not that time, friends. Not that time in this nation. There, there, are, there are some things happening in this nation. I got, I got, Sandy calmed me down last night because I got real spicy last night and I was going to talk about it this morning and Sandy's like, no, babe, that's, 
That's not right. But, but I'm, I'm telling you now, churches in this nation, you know, you know we've got, I, I'm not probably getting in trouble. Is this recorded? Does it go anywhere? Can you switch? Can you switch it off for a second? Bye guys! Thanks for tuning in. Just kidding. <laughs>